Good morning, good afternoon, um, wherever you are. This is Cherry Kubota, um, Ohio State University. Um, this is December Cafe. Um, so welcome to Cafe, uh, um, Indoor Ag Science Cafe. Um, so as usual, I go quickly, you know, the, um, um, some of the um, um, introduction part. Um, this is funded by USDA, um, NIFA grant to uh, promote indoor agriculture, particularly focusing on uh, vertical farming. And then this is the platform for conversation and information exchange. And particularly we are interested in science-based information and then also industry status. Um, let me go over. So today we have a, um, a presentation from University of Arizona team. Um, uh, and then, um, January Cafe, we are doing monthly. January Cafe, we have a presenter from Michigan State University um, talking about marketing um, aspect of indoor grown or vertical farm grown produce. Um, and then, as I said, um, today's presentation, um, uh, it's probably 45 minutes or so. Um, and then after that, we have a discussion time and that is not recorded. And then today's topic is the um, oh, I have a redundancy, sorry about that. Um, uh, crop growth monitoring and simulation based resource use optimization. This is a quite unique area. And then um, I'm hoping to develop this type of, you know, the research and capability further. And then the, the speakers are Dr. Mura Kachira, who is a professor of Ag Biosystem Engineering at University of Arizona, and then also director of the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center um, of the University of Arizona. And then his graduate student, uh, Casey Shastin, um, they're gonna co-present this topic and this is gonna be a good one. So, um, all right. So Mura, you can take it over. Great. All right, Sherry. Um, okay. Good. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry. And thank you for inviting uh, me and Casey for the uh, presentation to present today in the cafe. And uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and wherever you are. And I hope you and yours are safe and in good health. Um, and thank you for joining us for the cafe today. Um, as Sherry said, um, I and Casey are part of the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center. Uh, and this is a multidisciplinary research, uh, education, extension outreach program uh, under, the controlled, under the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences uh, in the University of Arizona. Um, um, with faculty, staff, students uh, sharing the same uh, mission and vision. Uh, and I have the pleasure of uh, working with an excellent and talented uh, group of uh, faculty, staff, and students. And that includes uh, KC. Uh, and also, uh, it's always uh, nice to see our former uh, graduates and team members, and some of them are joining today in this uh, Zoom call, and they do us proud. And we with whatever they do and the impact they have in the industry out there. So today uh, we are going to talk about some of the research that we're doing. And, uh, and this is part of our project uh, with the Optimia team and our colleagues. And this really uh, emphasizes uh, on the crop uh, growth monitoring and modeling and simulation and how we can integrate this into developing uh, resource use aware environmental control uh, applications uh, for controlled environment agriculture systems, including indoor vertical uh, farm applications. The majority of this presentation will be based on the research that Casey is doing. So he's your star today. I'm just gonna give an introduction uh, for our uh, presentation. Uh, as we look at future uh, food production systems, uh, we are going to need more integrated and complementary food production systems to address the challenges when it comes to food security uh, and resiliency. Uh, the fuel pro crop production will continue to uh, uh, grow the, uh, the produce and food to feed people, but controlled environment agriculture will continue to uh, uh, keep its uh, significant role and place 
uh, to be a complementary uh, food production system uh, providing uh, diversified uh, uh, products uh, to, to help feeding uh, the increasing world populations. But we will need to consider uh, smarter systems and resource use aware systems, uh, innovative uh, uh, production pra practices and control strategies uh, so uh, we could uh, improve resource use and resource use efficiencies. The main advantage of controlled environmental agriculture compared to field-based uh, food production system is that uh, we have a complete control uh, on both demand and supply conditions. We can even recycle some of the outputs uh, coming from the production system and they can be recycled, reprocessed and reutilized in a circular uh, fashion. So that's the advantage of controlled environment agriculture. In order to achieve resource conservation though, we will need to have an understanding uh, and integrate sensing and understanding of the plant and microclimate interactions to develop energy efficient, resources efficient control and management strategies in controlled environment agriculture uh, systems. Um, our metric should really emphasize uh, resource use efficiency. Um, of course, we will uh, focus on the crop yield and quality as this is the outcome that we are really looking into. However, we will need to consider the resource inputs in terms of energy, water, carbon dioxide, uh, the fertilizer, as well as labor uh, input. Um, uh, we, can, uh, we can monitor these uh, resource utilization uh, uh, in the, on the input side, uh, but we can also monitor uh, directly or indirectly quantify them through simulation or modeling for the edible biomass or non-edible biomass or other uh, outputs that we can consider as part of the production uh, system. Um, Resource savings and production quality can be uh, achieved uh, if we really consider uh, combining the uh, production system structure and physics uh, with crop uh, physiological information. It's, this is a complex system, but we need to consider uh, these to be able to uh, achieve uh, resource aware and resource saving uh, control uh, strategies and practices. Uh, through sensing uh, and monitoring, uh, we uh, should be really focusing on uh, plants being the uh, center of our attention, of course, uh, in collaboration with other environmental uh, variables. So we can use plants as sensors in the decision-making process or the environmental control applications. Of course, we will also need information about this, the system, the production system itself and the status of the processes. So we can integrate all of these into the control and management applications for crop diagnostics as well. Uh, so these decision support systems and environmental controls can take corrective uh, actions. Um, some of the precision uh, applications, precision agriculture applications uh, 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 includes, um, uh, the, the approach includes actually uh, determining or identifying what is needed in terms of resources, how much of that resource is needed, and when it's needed uh, for the plant uh, to achieve optimal growth, uh, growth. Then we can take quantitative and qualitative actions as well. Some of these precision uh, 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 techniques could uh, involve a speaking plant approach, which has been around for several decades now, and now becoming more uh, 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 applicable and interesting to integrate into artificial intelligence because the computational speed, the sensors and technologies are becoming more available. They're more available and they're uh, uh, less costly. And we can also consider biorobotics and biomechatronics as well. Um, automated crop diagnostics and decision support systems using uh, sensors, uh, computer vision, machine vision has been uh, among the emerging automation technologies uh, providing more direct information from the crop itself regarding to crop health and growth status uh, in addition to other environmental variables measured from the aerial 
and also the root zone environment, which has been the traditional uh, control and monitoring approach. But uh, the uh, the current systems, and as we look at the future, we are more plant centric. You know, trying to include plant responses directly. Uh, desirably using non-contact sensing applications as part of the environmental control applications. So the greenhouses has been taking an advantage of this, appreciating this inclusion of plant-centric, plant monitoring-based environmental control applications, uh, but also uh, the indoor vertical farm systems are uh, the platforms where these technologies are being incorporated and we'll see more of these uh, technologies integrated into environmental controls and decision support systems and as part of also artificial intelligence systems in vertical farming uh, settings. The, um, the GEM, the, uh, the genetics, the environment and management and interaction of these components are really critical and they will, it will contribute to the developments and optimized uh, uh, plant production uh, in controlled environments as well. So the genetics environment and management really pl is, it plays an important role in terms of the phenotypes that we are interested in and we can achieve in, in a production uh, system. Um, uh, genetics is definitely an important factor. Uh, the plants have a potential uh, to provide uh, the yield and quality uh, aspects, but uh, the way we control the environment will play a role in terms of what the outcome will be from that production. Of course, the management uh, will play a role in terms of the practices, the systems that are being used to improve the product productivity. Um, so there will be need for uh, uh, the engineering side of things, uh, the systems and technology side of things, really focusing on environment, environmental controls and management and, and analyzing uh, 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 these uh, uh, as part of uh, the systems designs and, 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 and monitoring management and controls. But also uh, we will see more development on the, uh, the breeding uh, and genetic side of things. So the plants can uh, also um, uh, use resources in an optimal way, maybe uh, with reduced resource use, uh, still being able to achieve the desired yield and quality uh, outcomes. But they are tightly, they're closely uh, related. And some of the critical indicators and uh, uh, crop production outcomes that we are interested in uh, uh, commercial settings is uh, our uh, fresh weight of the produce or dry weight, crop height, the leaf area, canopy uh, structure, architecture, canopy closure, uh, relative growth rates, and also uh, production quality uh, measures such as color, texture, flavor, and, and phytochemicals. Um, uh, these uh, uh, indicators or uh, phenotyping uh, features can be monitored directly using sensors and uh, sensing uh, 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 systems but they can also be simulated, modeled and simulated uh, and interactions uh, between the environmental variables uh, and the phenotype can also be evaluated to develop a better understanding and also uh, take advantage of this to consider a strategic and innovative ways to control the system so they can be resource user aware and resource uh, savings, saving. So um, that brings us to our focus uh, in our uh, multi-state uh, uh, project funded by USDA NIFA, because we are interested in co-optimizing, co-optimization of environmental variables to really help uh, enhancing the prof profitability of food production indoor in indoor vertical farming uh, settings. Our uh, teams are working on uh, different environmental set, uh, set points uh, with uh, various crops and crops varieties uh, to really determine and identify the critical uh, recipes and also uh, uh, work on what if scenarios uh, to achieve savings in the uh, in, in vertical farming based food production systems. Um, yes, we are doing some experimental work, but analyzing and considering all of the scenarios, all possible scenarios are cumbersome and they, they can be cost, uh, 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 costly. So that brings us to our focus in terms of the interest in modeling and simulation efforts. So we can evaluate these 
alternative scenarios and what if scenarios uh, when it comes to environmental variables. So we can consider this as part of our overall modeling approach uh, that really emphasizes the economics of the food production in vertical farming settings. So as part of uh, this collaborative effort, uh, in the case uh, of uh, University of Arizona, our team is really focusing on uh, various uh, leafy greens, uh, lettuce, uh, kale, and um, uh, uh, under uh, 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 different environmental conditions, uh, air temperature, humidity, BPDs, and CO2 levels and light uh, intensities uh, to understand their responses and include those in the modeling and simulation uh, efforts. Our research uh, 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 is uh, conducted in our vertical farming facility here at the Controlled Environment Agriculture uh, Center. Uh, we call this facility UAG Farm. And our uh, students are really an integral part of this, uh, all the uh, research that goes on uh, in these uh, efforts. And they are the actually leads uh, when it comes to uh, managing uh, our facilities and also conducting our research. Um, uh, activities. So that brings us to uh, the research that Casey is uh, working on, uh, which is uh, on predictive modeling and computer vision based crop growth uh, monitoring, sensing and monitoring, and developing a decision support uh, uh, application to optimize resources. So I'm going to uh, ha have uh, Casey to continue uh, uh, from this point on. Casey? There, um, I'm Casey Shastin, and uh, I'll be talking uh, about the, the the research that I've been doing. So, in the uh, vertical farm setting, uh, the typical way of growing a crop is to have it uh, at, at particular set points throughout its development, and that is a practice which uh, tends to produce a really consistent product, but. It doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily give you a uh, optimal resource use. For example, if let me see if I've got this working. Okay, yes. Uh, uh, when you're first getting your set point hour target, you might use a, a fair amount of uh, some resource, uh, and this resource could be uh, CO two concentration, it could be temperature, it could be the lighting. Uh, but uh, for now, just think of a generic resource. Uh, you. As you get your set point R target, you might use a, a, a large amount of resources. And then uh, from there on, you'll just need to nudge the set point back in and use uh, smaller amounts of resources. But as the, uh, for, the for the course of time, the cost of these resources might change. For example, uh, the lighting, uh, the, the energy cost can have uh, different values during different parts of the day. Uh, and uh, during peak hours, for example, uh, and those peak hours can be different. So the the getting your your resources uh, these these small adjustments in in the set point can uh, cause you to be using resources during times when the expenses is higher are, are, are higher. And in order to get around this problem, we can uh, institute a dynamic control instead of using set points. And this allows us to sh shift our use of resources per, uh, to uh, times when the, they may, may not be as expensive. But uh, the cost of doing this is we may disrupt the environment which uh, gives a consistent uh, growth yield. So uh, we may reduce our yield or, or even uh, increase our yield in certain scenarios. Uh, uh, but the, the the, the key takeaway here is that we've, we've lost a consistent growth habit. And, and in order to uh, fix this problem uh, we, that we've introduced, uh, we need to look at how the plants themselves are growing and have uh, measurements uh, over the course of time ab about how the plant is, is developing. And I, I call that phytometric feedback. Uh, and phytometric feedback is basically the process of, of measuring the plant in some way, seeing where it is it's in its development, and then using that information to feed back into the control system uh, is so that we can arrive at decisions about how to change the environment in order to get the 
the growth to uh, to happen and to, the development to happen uh, at, at, in a way that uh, that we desire and, and that is predictable. And this will uh, allow us to do things like uh, increase the resource use efficiency by targeting when these uh, expenses of resources occur, and also to by adapting the environment, we can ensure that the growth is on schedule and uh, that we have a consistent product uh, by a particular time. And by doing this, we can reduce labor costs by ensuring that there are no emergency uh, measures to harvest a crop that is a little bit late and needed in a little more time. Uh, or uh, uh, delays in the uh, transplanting process and also, this kind of information can be fed into a control system which has the ability to focus light or, or move the deck of the canopy in order to uh, change the lighting level on the, on the crop. And so it can also be used as a way of increasing space use efficiency in a facility. And the, 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 the best way to do this, I think, is using computer vision because uh, it, uh, it, it uh, preserves uh, a lot of information uh, about the individual plants and uh, is uh, a very data dense uh, sensor. So uh, my research revolves around uh, developing uh, and verifying that uh, both the eyes and the brains of such a system can be made to work. For the eyes, my, my system will use a camera, which is uh, above trained above the canopy down looking at a, a growing plants and measuring the top projected canopy area at a high temporal frequency in order to uh, feed this information into uh, a computer algorithm which is able to put out a, a number that can be given to uh, the control system to say where the crop is in its development. So uh, ideally the top projected canopy area would be a proxy for the biomass of the system uh, of the growing plants. And the, the brains are, will be a, a computer model, uh, which, uh, sorry, a, a mathematical model of how the crop grows, which is then used uh, to uh, inform a computer simulation on uh, how moment by moment various environmental factors would affect the growth of a uh, hypothetical crop. Then that simulation can be compared to the historical measurements of the environment that the crop has been grown in and compared against the top projected canopy areas uh, estimation of what the biomass is. And the, these two numbers would then allow you to know whether your crop is where it should be, uh, a little behind, a little ahead. And then that information can be fed into a uh, computer control system, which will make decisions about what the environment what the cheapest environment we can provide to the plant would be in order to promote the expected and desired growth. So the facility I'm using is the UAG vertical farm. And here we can control all kinds of different factors, Oops, sorry, all kinds of different factors uh, uh, of the environment, uh, of the, the, the electrical conductivity of the, the nutrient solution, the pH, the dissolved oxygen, we can uh, modify the lighting intensity, the temperature, and uh, we have some control over the relative humidity uh, and the CO2 concentration and power usage. Uh, uh, the CO2 con concentration is, is completely controlled and the power usage is monitored. And I am currently using all these uh, levels to grow various crops and validate that the model is able to make predictions in changing environmental conditions. And on this one level, encircled in red, I have a camera installed, which is fixed down on a certain area of the crop and monitoring the TCPA of the, the plants growing there. The sensors that are relevant to the model are CO2, uh, temperature, uh, and uh, PAR light intensity. And uh, of course, I've got this multispectral camera as well, and it is monitoring uh, in five different channels, uh, red, blue, green, far red and near infrared. And the camera will, again, it'll take the TCPA of the growing crop and feed that information, or sorry, sorry. It will uh, 
process that information into a, a number which uh, we can compare against the output of the mathematical model simulations. And uh, I, I don't have the control part uh, in, in my research uh, because it, it's, it, it's quite a lot to do all of that. Maybe if I was going for a PhD, but the, the, uh, these, <clears throat> sorry, been talking for a while now. <clears throat> Should have gotten some water. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, yes, and I, I will uh, hopefully have the. Ooh, let me get myself back on track here. Uh, so I'll, I'll be focusing just on the uh, the uh, TCPA and the the mathematical model for now. So the the image processing pipeline for the the software that I've written is. Uh, combines the red, blue, and green channels into a, uh, a color image, and then the background is subtracted from that image. And the software uses the number of pixels in the resulting image to calculate the area of the growing plant. And that gets output into a, a graph uh, that monitors the development of the crop over time in its uh, canopy area. So this graph here in particular, it monitor was monitoring a crop that was grown for a particular set of set points and the environmental conditions didn't change. Uh, the, the DLI was 11.6 and the CO2 concentration was pretty much just ambient. Uh, so this basically serves as a, a baseline for the model. Uh, and here is the, the same uh, data, but with the, the fresh mass in, in, in the light blue dots as the crop developed. And so you can see uh, for the first 21 days or so, the TCPA and the bio, uh, the fresh mass uh, follow each other very closely. And so it looks like the TCPA is a, a, a with a, a, a constant factor to adjust it down to the, uh, from to just adjust it from leaf area to biomass actually is a, a pretty good indicator of what the crop is doing. So talking for, about the model for a moment, there are three uh, particular inputs for this model. Uh, they are light, the power intensity, uh, the CO2, and the air temperature. And the model was originally used in greenhouses, and uh, I'm, we're trying to adapt it and validate that it works in the vertical farm setting. So the as I said, uh, the model inputs are the concentration of CO2, the temperature, and the light intensity. And these factors are fed into uh, equations which then uh, take other uh, constants uh, as that are uh, from previous research uh, that uh, uh, characterize the, uh, the plant's light uh, characteristics and its ability to uh, sequester CO2 from the air. So uh, the CO2 conductance and the things like the light use efficiency, uh, leaf area ratio and respiration are all fed into another equation which calculates the maximum rate of photosynthesis of the plant. And then that is used to calculate how much sugar the plant can produce. And the available sugars then are what's available to make plant structural dry mass. And then that whole process is fed into a loop and the uh, given environmental conditions at any given time, along with where the plant's structural dry mass is, is uh, uh, fed back through the equations and uh, gives you outputs at every moment of its development. And that uh, helps you, uh, that gives you a, a graph of the predicted uh, growth of uh, a crop for those given environmental conditions. So these are the environmental conditions for the crop as it was growing in the vertical farm uh, the, for the, the data that we saw earlier, the TCPA data. And I'll talk about each of these curves here. This is the CO2 in the room, uh, basically 400 parts per million during the times when the lights were on. And the light lighting intensity it was about 200 micromoles per square meter per second, a total of, uh, with 16 hours on and eight hours off. And the temperature during the light period was uh, 23 degrees Celsius. During the dark period, 19 degrees Celsius. And the blue curve tracks the uh, measured dry mass. Or sorry, um, is that dry mass? Yes, the measured dry mass. And the 
the orange curve is the predicted dry mass from the model. The top predicted canopy area on this graph is uh, in purple. And you can see that during these last six days or so, it flattens out and doesn't match very well with the predicted, uh, sorry, with the measured dry, dry mass. And the reason for this is basically uh, about a day before these plants uh, met full canopy closure, the leaves began to touch and the, the TCPA was no longer a good predictor for, uh, for what's happening with the crop. But basically it has to start growing up instead of out. And uh, I think maybe during this period, uh, if we switch to a different system, something that measured depth, we could maybe use the, the plant's height uh, as a, uh, to, to, to fill in the gap in the proxy for this region. Uh, the model has uh, a slight underprediction and a slight overprediction depending on when uh, you are looking in the crop, crops development. And I think that uh, that can be improved pretty significantly uh, using, oops, sorry, using a, uh, some modifications to the model. Uh, one modification that I made was to uh, move the root allocation from being a constant in the model to being a function. And that significantly improved the, the, the under prediction and over prediction. And I think there may be other fun, uh, constants which could be moved into functions and, and further increase its accuracy. But uh, I'll, I'm on the lookout for those uh, and I'll know more as I, as I continue my research. So uh, the model uh, can be visualized uh, maybe a little better if we uh, put it on some 3D graphs and uh, use any two inputs of CO2, light, or temperature and plot them versus yield. And that will help us to understand uh, a little better about what, what kind of optimizing the model is able to do. So these graphs are made with crops run through the model at set points. So each of the set points are, are, are shown in the horizontal axes here. So for this particular graph, we've got DLI versus CO2 concentration. And you can see that the yield increases as we increase either of those factors. Uh, so there's no real optimum. And in reality, uh, past uh, these, these uh, some level of CO2, maybe 900, maybe 1200, uh, we would start to see some drops in, in the, uh, the yield. Uh, same for DLI, because uh, uh, real plants would see some toxicity from uh, too much light or too much CO2, and that's not modeled by the model. The, that might be an opportunity uh, for future improvements to the model to, to add those types of uh, effects. But as long as the model is used within the validated region, I, I, it shouldn't uh, matter too much. So the... Uh, on this graph, we, we can see uh, uh, features of interest, uh, these, these contours of constant yield, anywhere there's the same color, we can basically start at a uh, similar, uh, different environmental conditions and still get a, a, a similar or, or equal yield. And so for example, we can have a low CO2 and high light point compared against a high CO2 and low light point, both being a, a 200, uh, grams per meter squared yield. Uh, and uh, we can see that there's a, a pretty significant reduction in energy by moving to the higher CO2 point. And because the cost of CO2 is so much less than the cost of energy, uh, that really represents a, a near 14% reduction in cost. The a similar graph, uh, only this time for temperature versus CO2 concentration, also gives uh, a, a graph, only this time there is a true optimum point. So anytime we're, we're off uh, of the ideal set point, the, the model indicates moving towards optimum would give higher yields. Uh, same thing for the temperature versus DLI. Uh, there's a, an optimum which uh, uh, is, is indicated by the model. And these graphs, uh, obviously uh, don't look at resources, but uh, if each of these factors, uh, the temperature, the, D the lighting, the CO2, were to be multiplied by uh, another equation, uh, which 
represented their their cost to 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 maintain those levels of set points then the this 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 mathematical model would basically represent a three-dimensional uh, space which uh, you could take a gradient function of and it, the gradient would point you in the direction of best increase in yield uh, for the for the lowest uh, costs uh, that 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 belongs squarely in the uh, the control system part, uh, which is slightly beyond the scope of my research, but uh, we can talk about that type of thing. Uh, and uh, another thing that the control system can do is instead of using set points, we can do this this type of analysis on a moment by moment basis. So, the, uh, for example, this is a graph of the how CO2 concentration affects the, the yield as, as predicted by the simulations of the model. So uh, in uh, a situation where we've got uh, 400 parts per million, basically ambient CO2 uh, growth, the, 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 the predicted fresh weight is uh, 152 grams per head. If we then change the CO2 level to 1200 parts per million in the simulation, we see a 70% a increase in, in yield, or 100 grams. The, then if we consider what happened at different moments when we put in that, that same 1,200 parts per million treatment, but only for week one, we see an 8% increase. For week two only, we see an 11% increase. For week three, a 21% increase. And then for week four, a 28% increase. So we can see that the model uh, is able to see that there's moments or times when different environmental conditions is, are, are more optimal or more, more likely to produce an effect uh, or, or a larger effect. So if we wanted to say optimize when CO2 is used, obviously the later in the, the, the crops development, the better. So the, the model lets us do things like uh, decide what environmental variables uh, are, 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 are most effective and uh, cheapest to use. And that, that would let us uh, minimize costs. And the model also lets us uh, predict what effects changing the environment would have. And that lets us predict things like yield and maintain the uh, desired crop quality and ensure timely harvests. And uh, that obviously would also reduce uh, labor costs. Uh, and uh, prevent uh, backups or uh, log jams in a, in a facility. Uh, and then we can also perform data analytics on what did happen versus what we thought should happen. And uh, when this type of information is fed into a control system, uh, the control system will be able to do things like uh, decide when, uh, uh, look, at, look at the outside temperature and the weather and the and decide when uh, when to uh, turn the lights on, when when the growth should be occurring, uh, and when is the most optimal or cheapest to to do these uh, effects. Uh, and also, uh, ho hopefully, you could see how the system can be used to do things like adjust the the canopy height or decide when transplanting should occur. Uh, I, a few moments also to uh, talk about the uh, how the control system might go about this. Uh, so uh, when we uh, slewed our, our set points in order to move when our resource use occurred, we may have introduced a, a change in the consistency of the product. So possibly represented by a loss of yield that we see here on this, this graph uh, line. And we can talk about different ways that we might restore that. We can try and do things like restore quickly uh, all at once uh, as soon as we, we, we institute that, 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 uh, that uh, change in the set points. Uh, we can uh, also try and restore the, the consistency of the crop slowly. And that seems like a, a more likely strategy because that would allow us to uh, be, have a more gentle effect on, on the development of the crop. And there's also a possibility that the cost can come back and be uh, 
reappear in, in a cyclic manner, uh, that we'd see that with energy, for example, uh, in peak hours being at certain times of day. But uh, also it, those, uh, and if that were to occur, we can do things like uh, introducing uh, a periodic restoration of the crop to its its normal normal uh, or, or desired, I should say, uh, uh, yield level. And all in all, this would be this would be a, a, a I think a machine learning uh, algorithm uh, would be, be best suited to to do this. Uh, where uh, if you think about, because if you think about uh, how a, a machine learning algorithm decides how to go through a chess game, it decides all the possible moves. Uh, we have more than one solution to getting our crop back to where it needs to be. And we need to look through all the different possibilities and look at which one uses resources most effectively. So if we can feed that into a, a machine learning algorithm, uh, then we should be able to, uh, it should be able to, uh, to do that for us. Uh, and there are machine learning algorithms that, that do this already. Uh, it's, like I said, it's a bit outside the scope of my research, but I, I, I think it's definitely doable. And I think that may be the end of my presentation. So if, Dr. Kachira, if you wanna take over. Uh, or, yep, there we go. Uh, yes, reinforcement learning, you got it. That's the one. Right. Thank you, Casey. Uh, and uh, before we uh, conclude our presentation, uh, we, would like, we would like to also thank uh, to our uh, uh, sponsor USDA NIFA, as well as our collaborators and partners as part of our Optimia project and the work that we are also conducting here at the University of Arizona. Uh, so with that, uh, I believe uh, we'll end our presentation here and we'll be happy to uh, respond to uh, the questions uh, uh, you might have. I believe there are a few questions also in the chat uh, window. Mm -hmm.